Let's stand as we sing, Majesty. You can be seated. I appreciate you being here tonight. And I hope that you're having a great week in the Lord and uh, that you're just able to do all the things that the God would have you do. I want to thank you for coming out Monday night for visitation. Uh, I know it wasn't a good night as far as the weather was concerned, but I appreciate you being here. And remember this Sunday or this Monday, next coming Monday, we'll have visitation again at 630. And this time it won't be dark, because guess what? Sunday you get to spring forward. And so remember to set your clocks forward, and uh, you might want to go to bed at 9 o'clock. Get up so you got a little extra sleep. You don't have an excuse, okay? So uh, please keep that in mind as the time changes. Also, I wanted to share a couple of things with you uh, about uh, the Roark family will be receiving friends from 2 to 5 here at the church, and the service will be at 5 o'clock this Sunday. So please keep that in mind. Also, Charles Ross' mother passed away about 2 o'clock today. Uh, please be in prayer for Charles and his family. Her name was Mona Ross, so lift her up, lift that family up to the Lord. And also, uh, Gaynell Ferguson's uh, sister, Alice McGinnis, is going to be having emergency surgery tomorrow. And I know they would appreciate you remembering them in your prayers as well. Is there someone else you'd like to add uh, to the prayer list? Eleven-year-old what? Okay, eleven-year-old nephew. In Cookville, as well. Nashville and Cookville. Anyone else? Yes, he's on the list. Yes, he is. I see his name on there. It's Ronnie Lloyd, so please be in prayer for him. Hmm. Devastation. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Roger. Baldwin just shared with me a memory in his life 50 years ago today. He got the privilege to stand on the yellow footprints. You want to know where that's at? That's at Paris Island. So he's remembering where he was 50 years ago at Paris Island today. I, Good. 
five bypasses. That's great. Also, Marshall Human will be going home tomorrow, and he's doing real well, so continue to lift him up in your prayers. Any others? Well, let's go to the Lord in a season of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day and for the gift of life and just for the privilege to be able to come back to your house and to worship you. And Lord, as we come back in, we, we come with all the things that have happened this week. We think of all the destruction from the tornadoes that took place in Nashville and down in Putman County. And Lord, those that lost their lives and people are still missing. And we lift those people up to you. We pray for them. And Lord, we thank you for those that were spared. And Father, I pray, uh, asking you to be with these requests that were made mentioned tonight. And I pray that you'd be with each one and each need. I pray, Father, that uh, as a church, that we'll be faithful to pray for people, to pray for one another, and to lift each other up in prayer, knowing that, Lord, we need that. And I pray that tonight as we uh, gather here, that we'll open our hearts to your word and just allow your word to indwell in our hearts richly and that you may accomplish everything that you want to accomplish in us through your word i pray father that we'll be a witness for you i thank you for the visits that we were able to make this past week and i pray for those that will be made this coming week and i just pray god you'll use those to touch lives and that people who aren't in church will begin to go to church and people that aren't saved will begin to think about their salvation and and Lord, where they'll spend an eternity. Because as we saw this week, a person can lay down to go to sleep. And they may not wake up. And Lord, it just reminds us the sense of urgency about sharing the gospel. Because there are no guarantees. And I pray that, uh, Lord, you would help us in our Christian walk to draw closer to you. Help us, Lord, to lean upon your everlasting arms to trust you in all that we say and do and are. And may you be our strength. No matter what is happening in life, may you be the strength of our lives. And Lord, everything that's accomplished, we'll give you the praise, the glory for it all. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand, love each other in the Lord, and enjoy a time of fellowship as the family of God. Right? You doing okay? Good. Is it that bad? Huh? Yeah. Hi, buddy. How are you? I'm just kidding. You doing okay?
If you have your Bible tonight, turn to Psalms 37. We're going to conclude our study in, in Psalms 37. And David, again, turns to his experiences. You know, one of the things that as you read this, Psalms 37, is pretty evident that David wrote down what he had experienced in life. Now, you may say, what's the big deal about that? Well, David was able to to write down how God had worked in his life, the experiences that he had had with God. And, and I, I challenge you, in your own life, keep a journal. You know, uh, write down when God teaches you something. Write down when God answers a prayer. Write down when you uh, see the hand of God at work in a situation. Because that will help you as you get older. You know what happens when you get older? The memory goes. You know what I'm saying? You don't remember as well. Now, David's an old, older person. I'm not going to call him an old man. I'm going to say he's just an older person in life. But uh, he was a person who had written down the things that had happened in his life. And so he kept him a journal. My grandsons that are going into ministry, uh, whenever I can, I have lunch with one of them, Josh, because he lives there, and the other one, Jake, he and I try to have some conversations along. But one of the things I told them, write down what happens in your life with the Lord every day. Write down your experiences. Don't have to be a long sentence. And listen, it doesn't have to be grammatically correct. Let me refer, let me say that one more time. It does not have to be grammatically correct. It's, this is a journal between you and God. And that makes the difference. People say, well, I, I don't write very good. I don't care. God doesn't, 
He isn't worried about that. Yeah. It's to help you to remember the great things that God has done in your life. And remember that he, he really wants to inspire people in their walk with the Lord. Let's look at verse 35 with me for a moment. And he says, I have seen the wicked in great power, spreading himself out like a green bay tree. Now, he says, I've seen the wicked really working. Now, who did David see working like that? Saul. You know, he'd seen the Saul and how Saul had chased him all over the countryside and how Saul had sought to kill him. What about his son Absalom? He had seen the wickedness of his own family member, and he had seen what had taken place. And so David tells us, I've seen the work of the wicked. Now, firsthand, uh, I didn't see it, but I've seen the pictures and read the history books. But about Hitler, the concentration camps, the evil, the wickedness that spread by Hitler and other dictatorships and, and people. And so we, we've seen the wicked at work. We've seen the power of, of the wicked. And, and David is wanting us to realize and, and to think about this idea of the power and, and the terribleness that they spread. That's what the wicked do. They spread their power. Now, I've used Hitler tonight, and we could use some other people. But, you know, even in our own day, the wicked are spreading their power. They're trying to spread it out. And he uses a tree, a bay, a bay tree. And, and the thing about this tree, this green bay tree, it was sort of like a, and not quite, but kind of like a, a cedar tree. And, and it, its leaves, it, it never changed. It stayed green. And it flourished where it was. And so he's, he's letting us know that these wicked people, he has seen their great power, and it has spread out just like this tree with its green leaves. It just spread out and kept touching lives around it. It just kept on touching, and that's the way the wicked work. They continue to touch. They continue to stretch out. He goes down in verse 36, and he says, Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yet, yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. Uh, I, I really like that word lo. <laughs> because he, in the Hebrew, it's, it's a word that's used for surprise. And in other words, yet he had, seen the, he had seen the wicked pass away, and he was not. Well, what, what's, why would he use a word kind of surprise? Because the wicked didn't think they'd ever pass away. You ever notice that about wicked people? They don't think they're ever going to leave. They think they're going to be there. They think they're going to endure. They're going to last. They're going to last. But they don't. And, and they, they, they pass away. And, and as he says, uh, they're not. They're not around anymore. And in some ways, they're forgotten about. And he says, yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. The wicked person was sought. But there was no trace for the ungodly. There was nothing left. Their, their influence was gone. And, and they were no more. And David said, this is what I've seen about the wicked. I've seen the wicked try to spread out their power, touching the lives of other people, and really in trying to influence people. But you know, one day, they're passed away. And they was not. They're surprised that they're no longer apart, and I can't find them. They're no longer uh, real. They're no longer a part of, of what's going on. And he goes on in the next verse, and he says, Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. He says, Mark the perfect man. Now, he's not talking about perfection. as a man being perfect or a man that's... Uh, uh, you know, doesn't have any faults or a person that doesn't have any faults. But he's talking about the one who is righteous, the marked man, the man who's right with God. And, and that's so important that you and I realize that we're right with God. You know, people say, why? what's important about that? Why is it important to be right with God? 
Well, David, David begins to give us the answer when he says, and behold, the upright man. When you see this man who's right with God, this man that's obeying God, doing what God would have him to do, one that's really trying to seek to follow after the Lord, that man, when it comes to the end, is at peace. That man is not surprised by death. That man is not one that's forgotten about. That man's remembered. You know, it's kind of like uh, you could mention certain people's names, and you probably couldn't remember them. You'd have to think long and hard about that person. But a man like Billy Graham, you remember that man. You remember the things he's done. Uh, I mean, I remember going to Nayland Stadium and hearing him preach when he was there uh, many years ago uh, for a crusade, uh, watching him on television and, and watching the, this man be interviewed and his testimony and the integrity of that man. I mean, he was a man of integrity. You know, he's one of the few people that did not want to handle the finances. He didn't want to be in charge of that. And, and you, you remember those things about him. And, and, and David is saying to us, the man who's right, the man who is upright, is a man who is a person that is at peace. Because he's right with God. And when you're right with God, there's a peace in your life. If you don't have the peace, then maybe you need to step back and look at your walk with the Lord. Maybe you need to step back and examine your life. Because the man that's walking with God knows he's following God's word. Being obedient to the things of God is a man who knows what peace is all about. Even in the midst of a storm, that man is at peace. Because he knows he's right with God. He's walking with God. He's, he's obeying God. He's loving the Lord and loving the Lord's people. He's just right. And there's peace. It's kind of like in a church. You know, you, you want to determine a church? Look how much peace there is. Because when there's peace, people are walking with God. Okay? When people begin to argue and divide like in the church at Corinth, it's because of what? Sin. Disobedience to the Word of God. Disobedience to following what God would have them to do. And there is no peace. There's divisions. There's schisms. There's divides. But when people are seeking to follow the Lord and, and, and you know, their life, then there's a peace that's there. And it's real. It's not a fake peace. I, I want to tell you something. If you just turned on your TV and watched the news, for an hour. You'd be so upset and so frustrated. And I don't know which side you fall on. That. That's neither here nor there. I'm just talking about, man, you, you just realize the turmoil and the schisms and the divisions. But when you're not walking with God, man, there is none. Why? We're following the Lord. Our focus is on Jesus, not on us. Not on what we want, not on our desires, but it's on Him. Who, who He is and what does He want from me in life. Look at the next verse with me for a moment. He says, but the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. Uh, I want you to notice something. When he's talking about there that the transgressors shall be destroyed together. In other words, it's at one place, one time, they're going to be destroyed. One place, one time, they're going to be destroyed. And he wants them to know that. They're going to be destroyed together. Together. Read Revelation, the great white throne judgment. And you read where the books are brought out and and the book is brought out, and, and all the wicked are judged together, one place, one time. And David is letting them know that this is going to happen to the transgressors, and they're going to be cut off. 
you know, a permanency of being cut off. And what a day that'll be that there's no hope, no future, nothing for them to hold on to in life. Absolutely nothing. Cut off from God. Cut off from the love of God. Cut off from the mercy of God. Cut off from God forever. One time, one place, cut off. And, and, and David wants the wicked, wants the, us to know this is, the, this is the end result of the wicked. The wicked may look like they're getting by. The, wi- the wicked may seem like they're going to skate through. But I want to tell you something. One day, one time, they're going to come together. And they'll be destroyed forever. What a day that's going to be when they will be destroyed together. We talk about the multitudes in heaven, don't we? We talk about the multitudes around the throne of grace. Think about the multitudes that will be around the great white throne judgment. Think about the multitude that's going to be destroyed together. All of God's children are going to be together rejoicing. They're going to be in misery. They're going to be destroyed together. In verse 39, he says, But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. And, the, you know, the word salvation here in the Hebrew, it really has to be a, a word about deliverance of any kind. And the, the fact that our deliverance of the, of the people that are right with God is of the Lord. It is the Lord who brings us through. It's the Lord who delivers us. In this life, it's the Lord who delivers us through eternity, but it is the Lord who delivers us. And if we could just remember that, you know, man, how much better off we're going to be because the Lord is is our deliverer. He is the one who brings the righteous through, those that are right with him. And I, I love to think about that phrase and thinking about the deliverance of any kind. That gives me a lot of comfort. Do you know that? I, I, that gives me a lot of comfort that no matter what I face in life, the Lord is my deliverer. And don't we all face a lot of different situations in life? I mean, how many of you have ever been close to a car wreck and, and you know, it, it didn't happen, but you were so close you could feel like it was going to happen? How the Lord delivered you. You ever been in a tough time in life where you had to do something you didn't want to do? And how the Lord delivered you through it? Maybe it was a medical issue. Maybe it was an emotional issue. Maybe it was a mental issue. You know, the issue could be anything. But to know that the Lord is there to deliver us who are right with him. To bring us through that. Those that are are right with him. Right in in, in knowing Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Having a personal relationship with him. Isn't Isn't that great to know that? I mean, what kind of God would he be if he didn't deliver us? Now, I'm not saying he delivers us the way we want it to go. But he's there to deliver us through that. He goes on in the last part of this and he says... He is their strength in the time of trouble. What do you do when you get in trouble? Pray. You know, we need to turn to the Lord. It's not about other people. The person who helps us is the Lord. And he helps us in our times of troubles, our difficult circumstances. The Lord is there to strengthen us. You know, to me, there, there's a special word about strength. Especially for me, since I've just gone through shoulder surgery. And uh, they go in there and they, they mess with your muscles and do all kinds of things to you that you don't want to know about. And I'm glad you get to sleep through it. You don't know what they do. But I do know this. Man, when I got back and started therapy, I couldn't lift one pound. I could not lift one pound. That's something, isn't it? I mean, 
Well, I just went to surgery. Had surgery. Two days later, I couldn't lift a pound. I don't have the strength. But aren't you glad the Lord gives us the strength that we need in our difficult times? Because I think a lot of us and most of us are just like me. We couldn't lift a pound. You know what I'm saying? We don't have the strength to lift anything, but praise God, He does. And He's our strength. He is our muscle. That, that's what kind of what I think about when I think about strength. He's my muscle. You know? He's my guns. But you never thought about the Lord in that term, did you? But is He not your strength? He ought to be. He ought to be your strength. And you ought to let Him be the strength because He is there to help us if we just let Him. Sometimes we're, we're guilty of not letting the Lord help us. How many of you say, I got this. I got this under control. No worry about that. None whatsoever. And you know what happens to me? Normally, I fall face first, flat on my face. But the Lord is my strength in times of trouble. Look how he closes out this verse, or this section. He says, and the Lord shall help them. Not only does the Lord strengthen us in the times of trouble, but he says, the Lord will help them and deliver them. Boy, how's it to always know you got a helper? David says several places, the Lord is my helper. I look into the hills from whence cometh my help. He acknowledged that his help came from the Lord. Nobody else can help us like God. Because he's the God of the impossible. And he can take the most impossible situation and turn that thing around and, and just bring you through that and help you through that situation like never before. And to know that the Lord is there to deliver us. You know, he will deliver you and me, bring us through those times in our lives. And he goes on and he says, and he shall deliver them from the wicked. Not only does he deliver us from times of trouble, but he delivers us from the wicked, those that would want to destroy us, those that would want to do everything they can to hinder us from following and being obedient to the Lord. And he saves us. But I love the last part of this. Why does he do that? Because we believe, because we trust in him. Why does the Lord do this? Because we trust him. We trust Him, we, we believe in Him, we, we really and truly have put our faith in Him. And when we put our faith in Him, man, He'll never fall. He'll never let us down. He'll never fail us. Trust Him in the Lord. Man, He's there to help me. I can trust Him. Oh, I, you, preacher, you don't know my circumstance. No, I don't. But I know this, the Lord does. You trust him, and he'll bring you through. Just depend on him. Trust him. Lean on him. It's so amazing to me in life. We talk about trusting the Lord, and, and we talk about how difficult that is. But I want to tell you, every day of our life, we do things trusting in man. When you get down here to high points, you get, you're getting ready to go across a bridge. How many of you jump out of your car, stop it, jump out, and look and walk across that bridge before you drive across it? Anybody do that? Why don't you do that? You trust it, right? Well, I don't know about you, <laughs> but I read a report the other day talking about how many bridges in the state of Tennessee really need to be repaired. I don't know if that was one of them, but it made me stop and think about that for a moment. What we trust. See what I'm saying to you when I say we, we, trust, we trust everything else. We trust. But when it comes to the Lord, Lord, I, I, can I really trust you? Yes, you can. And when you trust him, when you believe in him and you obey him, and you follow him, then he says, man, I'm going to help you. 
I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to be your strength because you're trusting in me. You're trusting in life. Trust me. How many of you ever told your kids something and then say to them, trust me? You ever told your kids that? Trust me. Well, trust the Lord. He's your heavenly father. And he's perfect and he can't let you down. No matter what your circumstance, no matter how great the wicked may seem, you just trust the Lord and he'll bring you through it. And I love that. You see, I think this ought to give us confidence. I think, man, we, when it comes to our lives, we ought to be people who are just so gung-ho, man. We're trusting the Lord. We know he's going to be our strength. We know he's going to deliver us. We know that he is there to help us in our life and bring us through it. And I can trust him. I can trust him. I believe him. I take him at his word. I challenge you. The next time something happens in your life and it becomes a, a struggle, trust the Lord. Trust Him. And look at what He'll do. Look at how He'll bring you through it. Look at how He'll deliver you and do things that you never thought possible. You never thought possible because He is the God who delivers us. The God who wants to help us. Isn't that great to know God wants to help you? Isn't that, isn't that great? What if I told you that God didn't care a thing about you? God just says, go live your life and be in a mess. Aren't you glad that God doesn't do that? Aren't you glad he says, I'll be your strength. I'll be your helper. Remember to trust him in your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this night, and we thank you for this opportunity to study and learn your word. And Lord, I pray, if nothing else, that all of us would remember to trust you. Because you are the God who delivers, the God who strengthens, and the God who helps us in our daily trials and struggles. You haven't walked away from us, for you're right here to go with us every step of our life. And we walk through some pretty tough situations, we think, in life. But you're always there if we'll just trust you and depend upon you. God, I love you. I thank you for who you are. And I love your people. I ask your blessings upon them. Draw them ever closer to you. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. This time you'll consider yourself in a business meeting. Uh,